we are. We're back live. Uh, hang on, uh, hang on to that thought, Bonnie. We do have Bonnie Yates. Aren't you guys excited? Uh, Bonnie Yates, for those of you who don't know, is a special education attorney, and she's amazing. We've got the top of your head, Bonnie. Uh, <laughs> if you're able to, there we go. There you are. Fabulous. Uh, and Bonnie uh, works with the law firm Hirji and Chow. And Bonnie, maybe if you could take a second and tell us a little bit about Hirji and Chow. Hirji and Chow is a six attorney firm of lawyers located in Culver City, California. Um, and we do special education, higher education, disability discrimination, regional center stuff, and maybe a little bit of everything else that, you know, is education related that we can help people with. Um, and they're amazing, everybody. You need to know that Hirji and Chow is amazing. And part of the reason why they're amazing is because they have Bonnie Yates there. Wow. Uh, so There's, you know, I mean, I was I was uh, sadly reading the the newspaper article about Michael Avenetti's fall from grace, and I was thinking about how what a terrible taste that leaves in my mouth when people are um, exposed to that. As this is like how lawyers um, respond to the privilege of being given a license to practice law, and I will say there are a really lot of good people in the education law field they are doing the work because they came to it because some family member of theirs um had special needs and you know i, I there are a lot of committed good people out there people that do things like social security disability help people apply for ihss services people that help other you know families do estate planning for their kids with special needs so I just want to sort of put in a little bit of a plug for the fact that, you know, in this field, I, I do think that people really do care. And I do think that people want good outcomes for clients. And, you know, I mean, we kind of suffer with you in a way. I, I went to an IEP on Monday that was just so crummy. And I just left and I just thought like, oh, you know, like another family, another family going to their IEP and being told, no, the district aid is great. You don't need, you know, a non-public agency aid in there. And they think their kids are regressing and they don't have enough money to put them in private school. And it's, it's just, you know, it's heartbreaking. But we, we care and we try within the limits of the system because, you know, it's really hard what parents of disabled children have to do and we know that any small adjustment that makes things slightly less stressful and slightly more positive probably pays bigger dividends for you know our client population than you know um, the celebrity a-list people or something anyway i think i'm supposed to give a disclaimer yes, and the disclaimer mean. is that we're talking to you about your rights we are licensed in California, ID is a federal statute. So we provide answers under state and federal law, but they're general. It's not equivalent to giving you legal advice, which if you have a specific problem and you're in Southern California, we can help you with that. And you need that, you, you know, you should try to get somebody to focus on your particular problem. And we do offer a, a complimentary consultation for people uh, in Southern California because, um, you know, we do feel like we can give people a lot of information in an, in an hour, and and um, they will then take it back out into the world with them, if nothing else. So I think that's a, the disclaimer. Okay. Now, we have a bunch of questions, Bonnie, because it is IEP season, as you well know. It certainly know. is. Okay. So the first question is, how do you even get an IEP? My five-year-old has a diagnosis of ASD, and the school is telling me he doesn't get an IEP because he went to a private preschool and he didn't need an aid. They say that they will observe him, and if there is an issue, we can ask for an IEP. I don't think that's how it works. And she says, we live in New Jersey. Okay, well, let's pretend you lived in California and okay. answer the question that way. It's probably similar. <laughs> a lot of the kids that we deal with already had an IEP from preschool. It sounds as if this family didn't do that. Maybe they had ABA services in preschool. Well, they're saying they didn't need an aid. It sounds as if their child was enrolled in preschool at some point during the preschool years, got an ASD diagnosis, but never secured an IEP. So now they're being told stuff that's, that's incorrect. Um, 
the stuff that they're being told is that because they didn't need an aid in preschool, they don't have a disability that has an educational impact. Well, that's just not true. They could have had an aid in preschool and sat in the corner the whole time and said nothing and learned nothing but caused very little problem and didn't get you know very much attention. But anyway, this person needs to start at the very beginning. They need to write a letter to the district and say, my, my child has a diagnosis of autism. Under state and federal law, you have a duty to you know, perform an assessment to see if he needs special education and related services because of his autism. You know, please send me an assessment plan immediately. And then after they do the assessment, if the child is found eligible, parent will have the opportunity to raise what are called child fine claims, meaning claims that um, relate to the district's failure to make the child eligible upon entry to what I'm assuming is kindergarten. But I, I think they, if you have a letter like that in writing delivered to the right person, uh, it's very dangerous of them to ignore that. And, and their reason is wrong, and they do have to assess. But over and over and over and over, districts are telling parents, we don't assess for that. Go to regional center. We don't assess for that. Go to a medical doctor. The, the threshold for assessment is very low. If there's a suspicion of having a disability, the district has to assess. They don't like that. It makes too much work for them. Oh, well, that's the law. If you don't like the law, don't break the law, change the law. There you go. Uh, okay, great advice. Uh, moving on to the next question. My 13-year-old says the special education teacher hit him. There is no mark and no witness. The aide was helping another student in the bathroom. I don't know what to think. My son is not a reliable witness as he has fabricated things in the past, but I tend to believe him this time. He is clearly agitated when I take him to school and begs to stay home. He had an accident in his pants the other day. I suspect to get out of going. <clears throat> what, excuse me, what do I do? My gut says to move him, but he would have to go to a school across town. His younger brother goes to the school he is at now, and getting them both to school on time would be impossible. Was the question, did the, did the question say the aid, uh, the parents suspect the aid hit him? No, the teacher. Teacher, And, and okay. she says the aid was in the bathroom with another student, so there's no, there's no witness. Well, this is a very hard question because it's, it's a real problem and parent is thin on proof. I think for starters, parent needs to write a letter, a polite letter saying, this is what was said uh, by my son. I'm not saying it's true, but he's behaviorally regressed since then. I'm very concerned. We need to call an IEP meeting to have a check-in about what's going on. If he's having behavior problems that are leading to adults getting frustrated with him, we need to discuss this collaboratively as a team. You know, please schedule the meeting immediately. I mean, it sounds like something's going on. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, she's not going to be able to prove it, mm -hmm. and she's going to alienate the teacher. So I think if you have the IEP meeting, you talk about the behaviors, the teacher knows she's being watched. Um, I'd try that for a little while before you try moving him so close to the end of the year. If his behavior gets worse, you also need to ask for a functional behavior assessment mm -hmm. because maybe it's unrelated, but if his behavior has started to deteriorate suddenly, they have a duty to address that. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, next question. My daughter is being terrorized by a student in her class. She has autism and an IEP, and so does the boy who is terrorizing her. I have, mm -hmm. gone, I have gone to a support group with the boy's mother, and she has told me this. She is one of those moms that keeps her lawyer on speed dial, so the school is afraid of her. This mm -hmm. boy calls my daughter names, talks loudly about her bottom during P.E. He, uh, he tells her she smells funny and that she makes him sick. He says this loudly and often. I have talked to the teacher and the principal, and they tell me they are dealing with it and that they can't tell me what, what they are doing because they can't talk to me about other students. But it continues to happen, and I'm watching my daughter, who has always loved school, start to hate school. 
I should say this is all happening in a gen ed class. They are both part of an inclusion program. Okay, well, this situation does happen, and it's very difficult because you've got the school trying to balance the special education rights of two children. And if the parent's perception is that the school district is afraid of the other mom because the other mom has um, an attorney that is uh, is having ongoing involvement with things, that would tend to lead to the district, unfortunately, being intimidated and uncomfortable and not knowing what to do. So, um, and, and I see this happens a lot, you know, so the kid is sort of engaging in bullying behaviors, but... Um, but, you know, the district is afraid to intervene. I think this mom has to do sort of like what I said before. She has to write a polite letter explaining what's going on, explaining that she doesn't blame the other child. She understands he has a disability, but this is still hurting her daughter. And so she needs an IEP meeting to address what's going to be done because the kids can't stay in the same class. Somebody's going to have to move. Um, and somebody needs to do something soon because her daughter's getting, you know, hurt every day by this kid, and it can't go on. And, you know, unfortunately, that's the kind of situation where if the other side has a lawyer, it's going to be difficult for you to represent yourself. You're going to need a lawyer, too. Anyway, um, that's a very tough situation, and parents are always surprised when the district is sort of passive and doesn't intervene. I think it's because they are honestly perplexed and don't know how to manage this situation because both kids have legal protection. So um, I think you just got to, like, initiate the discussion because, you know, and document everything that's happening because um, at a certain point, that level of disruption becomes uh, interfering of her ability to concentrate and pay attention and be comfortable at school, and that then starts to look like a denial of faith. Yeah, and, and I, I totally agree, Bonnie, that sometimes as parents we forget, you know, you have a discussion with somebody in the hallway and you feel like you've done what you need to do, but you need to put everything in writing and document what yep. you said. You know, it's, it's that thing of, of writing later as per the conversation that you and I just had in the hallway, and now it's in it, writing. You know, um, lawyers have a general rule that everything is put in writing, and that's not a bad rule for, for you know, parents with kids with disabilities either. There are special exceptions to putting things in writing. Like sometimes if we want to tell an expert something, but we don't want it to be subpoenaable, and their their records are subpoenaable before a due process hearing. We will purposely tell them the information in person or over the telephone. But what I'm saying to all of you is that's the exception and not the rule. When you're dealing with a school district and you have is issues relating to an IEP or to a free appropriate public education, you should always be documenting and writing. And email's very easy. And everybody has email now, so it's not like you have to write a formal letter, but these things have to be documented. And you know something very interesting, too, is parents write a lot of letters to the school district about concerns they have. When we request the district records, we don't get any of those emails. The district never provides those. So it's important not only for you to write the emails, but for you to be able to access them afterwards because they will tell the story in a way that we could never understand from just reading the records. District, district descriptions of what the student is like or what is going on with the student are so incomplete and so misleading and it just uh, it continues to amaze me. I went to an IEP the other day for a student, um, the one that I said was really depressing, not student, the IEP. And when I got there, I learned that this student has great academic strengths and he's ahead academically. Um, I would not have known that from anything that I read about him in the material supplied by the district. So we have to create our own evidence. That doesn't mean we're making stuff up, but every time the district writes something down, it's a piece of evidence that they can use in a due process case. We need our own documentation. Okay, well, I, I always think back to, uh, I don't know whether it was you or somebody in your office, Bonnie, who said to me, document everything 
uh, in case, you know, because you're going you're gonna to need it for one thing or the other. Act like you're going to write a book uh, in 10 years and you're going to want to piece it back together and, and not have anybody be able to sue you. I still have the emails <laughs> because somebody in your office said that to me. I was like, oh, okay, you know, in case I need to write a book. Uh, so document everything, you guys. Okay, next question. What determines if my child is eligible for extended school year? Okay, well, extended school year is something which most kids with autism should have as part of their IEP. But extended school year can be um, afforded to anybody. What extended school year is, is it's summertime services that are um, appropriate for students if they regress um, during the summer and it takes them a long time in the fall to recoup their skills. So there's no standard test for ESY services. It's not like, okay, he regressed and it took three weeks to get him back to normal. Okay, he regressed and took a month. But if it starts to being much longer than a month, I would just say, reasonably speaking, that's regression that's too long and too difficult and so the student should be entitled to extended school year services so that he doesn't regress to that degree and take that long to recoup the skills while everybody else is moving forward in terms of learning um so what i hear a lot is there's no esy program here so you don't get esy services and that's a misnomer General education classes, it is true, are unavailable in the summer. But if you read the law on what an extended school year service is, it doesn't have to be a classroom. It could be a service like a reading program, or it could be tutoring, or it could be occupational therapy or speech therapy. So if somebody says to you, you know, he's not eligible because we don't have a classroom here in the summer for general ed kids, that's the wrong standard. The standard okay. is regression recoupment ratio. Okay. Uh, next question. What happens if my child doesn't meet one of his IEP goals? Do they just roll it over to the next year, or is it possible I can use this to get different, different services? I don't feel like my son is making progress, and they don't seem concerned. I don't know how many goals a student had. Uh, you know, so it's a little hard to make sense of the question fully because if you if you have seven IEP goals and you meet six of them, that's going to be less a reason for concern than if you have three IEP goals and you don't meet two of them. Um, the analysis of the of the goals uh, gets made several different ways. Uh, so I'll just talk about it for a little bit. When you're at your IEP, a common error that is made is they have to they have to say where the student is currently so they have to have a baseline but a lot of the time if you read the baseline it's not measurable so if the baseline is not determined accurately then when you go to measure goal progress it won't be accurate the goal itself has to be something which somebody in another state they could read the goal without any you know, context cues from, like in you know, a lot of the time at an IEP, people say, well, what this means is X, or we do it like this, and I say, no, 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 it can't be inferred. It has to be obvious from the, the four corners of the document what the skill is, is how, and you know what the percentages of, of accuracy are, and how many times you're going to, you know, to uh, test it to see whether the student meets it at the agreed upon percentage of accuracy. And if a year after the goal is written, he can meet the goal at the agreed upon percentage of accuracy, he's met the goal. Now, when people don't meet goals, districts do all kinds of funky stuff. Sometimes they discontinue them without writing a new goal to address the area of need. Sometimes they just carry over um, the same goal uh, into the next school year. And the problem with that is we have IEPs that we get where the goals are just carried over year to year. They're, they're not working, students not meeting them, and yet nothing is revised. So one, one goal is not a hill to die on, but if you have a larger problem with the goals not being met or the goals not being measurable, that's definitely something that you need to address at your IEP meeting. Okay. 
And then last question, because we're running out of time. Uh, what does it mean uh, that my IEP is locked? Ah. I didn't sign because I didn't want to read, because uh, I wanted to read through it. They had a problem with the printer, and I agreed to get the copy the next day. I read through it over the weekend, and there are errors I'm not comfortable leaving in. They are telling me it's locked. And if I want changes, I have to have a whole other meeting and an amendment. I didn't sign it. How can it be locked? Okay. I'm suspecting that this person is in Los Angeles Unified School District. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe they are not. But LAUSD has a whole host of excuses that they use to manipulate parents because of the computer program that they use to write IEPs, which is called Welligent. So Welligent is like something that um, is like a, a fillable form that they use to complete their IEPs. And I think it has, I mean, I haven't really ever played with it, but I suspect the way it works is like if you do section A, it may be hard to go back and redo section A if you're in section B. And then when you get to the IEP, end of the IEP meeting, they will, they must hit some like save button or something and then the IEP is quote unquote locked. I will answer this question and the parent is in the right and not the district. So we get, we get documents from LAUSD that are stamped draft all over them. That's being given to us as a final document. That is not a final document, that's a draft. We also are in IEPs where they say things like, well, agent won't let me write this, you know? And I basically say, I'm, I mean, I'm kind of snarky about it because it's just annoying. You know, like, hey, I know we're in the era of the self-driving car and everything, <laughs> but your computer program cannot override a federal or state, you know, right, educational <laughs> right that a person has. So, you know, solve your computer problems. So I think what this parent needs to do, she does not have to have another IEP to make the changes. That's absurd. Um, she does not have to have an amendment. She does need to write the district a letter and tell them, I don't know what you need to do to unlock your IEP, but you're behaving illegally, and if this isn't fixed in one week, I'm going to file a compliance complaint with the state of California, and I think they'll fix it. There you go. Well, we just rapid-fired through those questions, Bonnie. You're kind of amazing. Um, but uh, it's all about caffeine. <laughs> Well, thank you for being with us. Tell us again about Hear G and Chow and where we can get a hold of you and them. Uh, Hear G and Chow is in Culver City. Our phone number is 310-391-0330. Our um, website address is lawyer number four, so lawyerforchildren.com. And we're boringly predictable. If you drop in, we'll be sitting in our little cubicles reading somebody's IEP and trying to make sense of it. There you go. Well, we appreciate you, and we appreciate Hirji and Chow. Thank you so much for being with us. And uh, as I was telling them, next week we're going on to a different format uh, where we're going to be on an hour a day. And so uh, this segment is going to air on Mondays, uh, but not starting this next week. It'll be the week after because we'll, it will be the week after. Uh, we have a special week this week with Autism Awareness. So look for the next episode of Bonnie's on the 8th of April. Uh, and Bonnie, thank you so much for being with us. No problem. My pleasure, everybody. Enjoy the weather. Stay on the phone with me for a second, Bonnie, as we go to okay. break, just so I can confirm something with you. But uh, everybody else, stick with us. We're going to go to a commercial. When we come back, we are going to have Sasha Long, the founder and president of the Autism Helper. Stick with us.